Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is March 24th. Today in garden history, we celebrate Mark Catesby, the English naturalist, adventurer, explorer, and artist. He was baptized on this day, March 24th in 1682. When America was still a British colony, Mark made two trips to the New World, and on his second trip, he explored the lower southeastern corner of the United States. After returning to England, he published his masterpiece, the very first account of flora and fauna of North America, and he put it together in two large folios called The Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands. Mark provided the text as well as the outstanding illustrations, and he also offered an overview of the climate, the soil, the water, and the crops that were being grown. Mark was a superb nature artist. He depicted birds and plants together, something only a handful of artists did at the time. Maria Sibylla Mirian did that. And like Maria's work, once you've seen Mark's work, you never forget it. Mark also painted living subjects, which made his depictions more lifelike. In Mark's book, the very first plant that he dedicated a full page to was the magnolia, and he also included a full page of text. Now, magnolias are one of the planet's earliest flowering plants, and as a result, they existed before bees. Now, for gardeners, this is an important clue about how magnolias reproduce, and it also explains why magnolias rely on beetles for pollination. And so, magnolia blossoms do not produce nectar. Instead, they produce pollen for the beetles that pollinate the magnolia. Now, in terms of uses, the bark of the magnolia in Chinese medicine has been used to treat respiratory illness and anxiety. And today we also celebrate the birth of the English chemist, polymath, author, and minister, Joseph Priestley, who was born on this day, March 24th in 1733. Joseph conducted many experiments while he tutored the sons of the American sympathizer William Petty, the second Earl of Shelburne, at Bowood House in Wiltshire, England. And in one of Joseph's experiments, he put a mouse and a mint plant together in a bell jar. And without the mint, the mouse died. But with a plant inside the jar, the mouse survived. And Joseph's experiment laid the foundation for the study of ecosystems. Joseph also wrote the first comprehensive study of the history of electricity. He invented carbonated water. He created the very first timeline. He discovered laughing gas. And he also came up with a practical use for vegetable gum. It could remove pencil marks from paper. And today we know it as the eraser. And today we also celebrate the fantastic British textile designer, poet, writer, and social activist, William Morris, who was born on this day, March 24th in 1834. Born to a wealthy family, William was the leading figure of the arts and crafts movement. As a designer, William Morris remains popular, and his designs were all based on nature. Trees and plants figure prominently into his patterns, and many of his designs feature the flowers that bloomed in his very own garden. Among his favorites were honeysuckle, rose, acanthus, tulips, and chrysanthemums. But he wasn't a fan of geraniums. William Morris once wrote, 
Red geraniums were invented to show that even a flower could be hideous. The very first William Morris wallpaper was called Trellis. It came out in 1862 and was based on a rose trellis at his garden in Kent. And in general, William found inspiration in England's magnificent gardens and countryside. His most iconic designs include Larkspur from 1872, Jasmine came out that same year, Willow from 1874, Marigold, 1875, Wreath in 1876, and Chrysanthemum, almost 11 years later, in 1887. William's poems about nature are often very clever, and they offer a glimpse of his personality In 1888, William created his design for Autumn Leaves, and he also wrote a seasonal poem called Autumn. Here's an excerpt. Late in autumn, here I stand, worn of heart and weak of hand. Naught but rest seems good to me. Speak the word that sets me free. In 1890, William designed his first tapestry, which depicted four medical women holding a banner with the words of an original poem that William wrote. The poem celebrates the orchard in every season, from the bounty of harvest to the promise of spring. And it goes like this. Midst bitter mead and acre shorn, the world without is waste and worn. But here within our orchard close, the guerdon of its labor shows. O valiant earth, O happy year, that mocks the threat of winter near, and hangs aloft from tree to tree, the banners of the spring to be. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Reflections of Paradise by Gordon Taylor. This book came out in 2020, and the subtitle is The Gardens of Fernando Caruncho. Well, every time I think about this particular book, I regret the fact that it was released during the pandemic because I think it would have gotten so much more attention had it been released just a year earlier in September of 2019. But that said, people are still discovering the magnificent gardens created by Fernando. He is a Spanish landscape designer, and he has been designing gardens for over four decades. His gardens are all over the world. They include elements from Zen gardens, Islamic gardens, and classical gardens from Europe. Fernando is very sensitive to scale in gardens, the amount of light and how light can impact garden design. And he's also a huge fan of using local materials, not shipping in a bunch of different stone and elements from far-flung places around the globe. Fernando is all about looking to the region, to the location, to determine what beautiful elements should be incorporated into his garden. Now, in this book, Reflections of Paradise, Gordon Taylor is profiling 26 Fernando Caruncho projects. And these gardens run the gamut from large estates to private little spaces. You will see an incredible vineyard in Italy. You'll see a private garden in France. There's a magnificent estate in New Jersey, which reminds me that I saw a beautiful Fernando Caruncho garden featured on a Monte Don special. And, you know, that's kind of how it is with Fernando Caruncho, because once you know about him and once you've seen some of his gardens, then he is just going to pop up everywhere in your life. In any case, this book features extraordinary environments that are landscape focused, that are designed to perfection, and that are unmistakably Fernando Caruncho's creations. This book is 304 pages of 26 incredible gardens designed by Fernando Caruncho. 
And the cover is extraordinary, too, I might add. You can get a copy of Reflections of Paradise by Gordon Taylor and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $29. Finally, today's Botanic Spark features a display garden. It was on this day, March 24th in 1993, that 2.4 acres of the Kreider Display Garden was donated to the town of Middlebury, Indiana. The garden was formally dedicated two years later and is known as Kreider Nursery's World's Fair Garden, a garden park. Kreider Nursery's origins date back to 1896 when Vernon Kreider supplemented his teaching income by planting berries on 30 acres of land. A decade later, Vernon quit his teaching job to start his nursery full-time. The nursery had grown to over 500 acres when the Century of Progress Exposition in Chicago was looking for a nursery to set up display gardens. Vernon signed on to the project, but had no way of knowing how the World's Fair would change his business. At the fair, Kreider Gardens set up many different displays in the horticulture building, and the gardens represented gardens from around the world. For example, there was a Japanese garden and a Dutch garden with a windmill. The gardens got a lot of attention, and visitors happily shared their contact information to receive the Kreider Nursery Catalog. Well, by the end of the exposition, Vernon had over 370,000 names and addresses for his catalog. The old saying, the money is in the list, proved true for Kreider Nurseries, and they became the largest mail-order nursery business in the United States almost overnight. Soon there were so many mail order requests that the Middlebury Post Office had to be redesigned to handle the volume. And at one point, Kreider Nurseries was the largest employer in Middlebury. In 1946, in an attempt to keep growing, Kreider Nurseries spent $11,000 on a patent for a thornless rose dubbed Festival. It was the most amount of money ever spent by a single nursery for a patent, and they had to learn how to cultivate the Festival Rose all on their own. Another Kreider claim to fame was that the nursery provided all the roses for Trisha Nixon's wedding. Well, despite their successes, Kreider's business declined in the 1980s, and by 1990, Kreider Nursery closed for good, almost a hundred years after Vernon's humble start. Today, the Kreider Nursery legacy is the Kreider Garden, lovingly restored and maintained by the Middlebury community since 1995. The garden pays homage to the display that Kreider Nurseries created for the Chicago World's Fair, complete with the original Dutch windmill and the giant toadstool sculptures that were a hit with the crowds back in 1933 to 1934, as well as new elements like the ever-changing quilt garden. It's one of several quilt gardens in northern Indiana Amish country. Well, that's it for today's show. Just remember that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.